Hi students, welcome back. Today we're going to be reading chapter 13 and 14 together, so make sure you're reading along while you're looking at the questions. You can read them or listen and do the questions while I'm reading and pause it, or you can listen and then go back and do it again. If I do it again, I mean listen and then listen again. Chapter 13. I wonder how Katie is doing. I was thinking as he shook some of the snow from his head. I hope she's warm. I hope she's safe. I'll never forgive myself if anything happens to her. Matt frantically looked down at his musket as he tried to figure out how to load it. His shoulders had been tense as he thought of the overwhelming task before him. On turning to look at his friend, Matt was horrified to find Israel stooped over on the ground, groaning. Israel, Matt cried, leaning down beside him. Israel, what is it? What's wrong? But Israel didn't answer. He was on his knees, bracing himself with one hand on the ground, and with the other, he reached for Matt's arm. His body suddenly went rigid as he began to violently throw up. Matt turned his head away, embarrassed, not knowing how to help his friend. When Israel finally exhausted himself, he loosely, sorry, he loosened his grip on Matt's arm. Israel sank back onto the ground, trembling. He slowly lifted his head and Matt winced as the, at the sight of phlegm and blood dripping from Israel's mouth. Forward on, the call was given to continue the march. Matt and Henry helped Israel to his feet. He could barely stand and was weaved and weaved unsteadily as he tried to put one foot in front of the other. Lean on me, Israel, Matt whispered, coming close beside him. Together, the two of them kept up as they best could. The pace was extremely slow due to the storm and the poor condition of the road. Matt, as Matt looked down, he could see the bloodied snow left by the bare feet of those that had gone before him. After what seemed like hours of marching, Matt could feel the full weight of Israel's body. He suddenly realized that Israel had given up trying to walk at all. Henry, help, Matt called, for he and Israel had begun to topple over. Henry reached over and grabbed Israel's arm and tried he Together, he and Matt tried to drag him along. They hadn't gone far when Israel sank to his knees again, pulling them down. Matt and Henry got to their feet just as an officer rode off by on horseback. Move him to the side of the road, the officer ordered, on seeing Israel slumped over in another fit of retching and coughing. As they dragged him off to the road, Matt felt something hot on his hand. He looked down and was horrified to see that some of the blood that his friend was bringing up. Wiping his hand in the snow, Matt cringed with the thought that it was the first bit of warmth he had felt for hours. Israel was suddenly quiet. The spasms had stopped, but this time he didn't try to stand. Come on, Israel, I'll help you, Matt offered. But Israel smiled weakly and shook his head. You'll have to go on without me, he said hoarsely. Oh well, no, Israel, you can make it. You can lean on me, Matt cried. You've got to take care of those Hessians together. Remember, we're a team. Let him be, Henry whispered, pulling Matt away. There's enough here to take care of the Hessians. Israel's fight is over. Let him be. But, but we can't just leave him here alone, Matt said. He'll freeze to death. We'll, we'll go to his reward. Sorry. He'll go to his reward either way, Henry told him. Better let him out of his agony now than to drag him along any further. Come on. We've got to catch up to the regiment. I won't, and I can't, Matt said, fighting back the tears. He's my friend, and friends die, Henry shouted, grabbing onto the front of Matt's sweatshirt and shaking him hard. And you'll die too if you stay here with him in the storm. You'll freeze to death. Don't you see? But Matt wouldn't listen. He pulled himself away and knelt down beside Israel. Stay here then, you little fool, Henry called, as, as, exasperated. But if you change your mind, just let him. Just get back in the road and follow it till you find us. Whatever you do, don't fall asleep or you'll never awaken. Stood shaking his head and unwrapping the wool strips that he had wrapped around his hands. He threw them to Matt in a brisk voice said, wrap these around yourself and you'll say, you, and you may save a few fingers. Matt watched as he unbuttoned the blue cuffs on his coat and pulled them down over his bare knuckles. Then without another word, Henry, Shooter turned and ran until he finally disappeared into the long stream of soldiers that moved along the road.
Matt put his arm around Israel, who seemed to be dozing. He wondered if Israel even knew he was with him as, he, as the steady line of men marched past. Matt grew panicky with fear. He longed to call out to them to stop and take him with them. He saw that most of them had their heads lowered and didn't even notice him. And those who did gave him a mournful nod and quickly looked away. I wish we were going with them, Matt thought, now jealous of those that were on their way to battle. At least we would have a chance. What chance do we have here? He was suddenly overcome with a strong ammonia scent of urine. Looking down, he could see that Israel had wet himself and didn't even seem to know it. Matt took to the rags that Henry had thrown at him and laid them over Israel's pants. It was all he could do to, that's all I could think to do. His eyes filled with tears as he realized just how helpless Israel had become and how desperate their situa situation was because of it. Maybe Henry was right, he thought. Maybe friends do die and that doesn't mean you have to die with them. Maybe he won't even miss me, Matt thought, looking into Israel's closed eyes. I don't wanna die, I wanna live. I wanna live, he whispered slowly, taking his arm from around Israel's Matt reached over and picked up his musket. He stood up and was about to join the soldiers filling past when Israel suddenly opened his eyes and smiled. Go on then, Matthew, go on ahead, it's all right. I'm just gonna take a little nap, he said, curling up on the frozen ground. Matt's musket fell from his hands and he sank back into the snow. No, Israel, stay awake. You've got to stay awake, he cried, pulling his friend up against the tree. Israel blinked and his eyes met Matt's. Don't worry, old goat, Matt said, holding him in his arms. I'm here with you and I'm not going anywhere, he whispered softly. Then with his half-frozen fingers, he brushed the snow from Israel's cheek. A pouch, Israel said faintly. Can you get it for me? It's in my pack. Matt reached into the pack on Israel's back and pulled out the small leather pouch. The beads put them in my hand so I can see them. Will you, Israel said. Sure, Matt replied, opening the bag. Then he uncurled Israel's half-frozen fist. The fingers had become blistered and were turning purple with the cold. Matt held the pouch upside down and carefully shook it. On seeing the pretty blue beads, Israel smiled. They are fine, aren't they, he sighed. Matt looked down at the delicate little beads that were so gently cradled in the dirty, frozen hand. Very fine, Matt whispered. Promise me, Matthew, that you'll get them to her, Israel said, struggling to keep his head up. Miss Abigail Gates on Denbury Road, Haverson, Massachusetts. He slumped back down out of breath. What are you talking about, Matt wiped at the tears falling from his cheek. Of course she'll get them. We're gonna bring them to her together, remember? You did invite Katie and me to come and visit you and Abby and the boys. We're going to bring Abby the beads together, Israel, we are. But Israel shook his head weakly as he breathed, sorry, his breathing became more labored. Please promise me, he gasped. I promise, I promise. Matt said, pulling into his chest, Miss Abigail Gates on Denbury Road, Haverson, Massachusetts. Don't worry, Israel Gates, you have a friend in Matthew Carlton, he whispered. Softly as the tears on his face began to freeze. You can depend on it. Israel could no longer speak, but Matt could feel him thanking him with his eyes. Matt put the beads in his sweatshirt pocket, keeping his other arm around his friend. They sat huddled together like that for a long time. A steady stream of soldiers passing before them began to blur as Matt's field of vision narrowed. The howling of the wind seemed to lessen and an enticing quiet crept over the landscape as the snow silently encased the two comrades in this frozen cocoon. Matt felt his eyes beginning to close and to help him fight the urge to sleep, he began to talk. He told Israel all about himself and his life in the future. Israel seemed to be going in and out of consciousness as Matt rattled on about dirt bikes, VCRs, <laughs> VCRs like the old DVDs, and pizza. I know, yeah, Batman. I've got to tell you about Batman. See, there's this guy, Bruce Wayne, who's living in Gotham City. Are you listening, Israel? And that was chapter 13. Let's go ahead on to chapter 14. Some things to point out before we do are um, on that last page. They have a lot of good talking point or listening about how they're in a frozen cocoon, using words like enticing and howling wind. That's good to think about, but um, yeah, pretty sad. Cool.
chapter there. Chapter 14. Wake up, wake up, son. Come now, it's no time for sleeping. I could hear a deep voice calling. It sounded as if it was coming from the end of a tunnel. As he, he groaned as the voice got louder. I'm getting up, Dad, I am, Matt mumbled with his eyes still closed. Tell Mom I don't want any breakfast. I've got gym first period of day. I'll just throw up if I eat anything, he moaned. Glad to hear that you still have enough life in you to be talking about breakfast, the deep voice replied. There you are, on your feet. Matt opened his eyes and found himself standing, or rather leaning, on a heavy set man in a brown wool coat. So he'll be thinking like he was so deep in sleep that he thought he was back at home and it was a dream. There was an older man in a brush, brushy gray eyebrows and a bristly mustache. Dad? Is that you, Dad? Matt croaked. The man smiled, shaking the snow from Matt's head. No, lad, I'm not your father. My name is Nathan Hornby. You're just a bit confused is all. Come on, then you need to thaw out and get some of that breakfast you're groaning about. My farm is just through these woods, not an hour's ride. We can take my bets here, he said, walking Matt to his horse. Matt blinked hard and suddenly realized where he was. Israel, he called out, my friend is sick. He said, turning to face Mr. Hornby. You gotta help me with him, Matt pleaded, and he looked behind him, searching for Israel. But Mr. Hornby quickly turned him around. No, lad, don't look back there, he said, keeping his large, gloved hands on Matt's shoulders. I'm afraid there's nothing more to be done for your friend now. But I can't leave him, Matt protested, wriggling out of the old man's grasp and running from him. When Matt reached the tree, he let out a sound that was half cry and half scream, for there lying on, the, on his back was Israel. Matt knew it was Israel because he could see the bit of blue from the old coat that was stuck out of the snow and the bright red sneaker. With it, it's frozen laces all undone. There's a little, there was little else to recognize for the storm had left its gruesome mark, erasing Israel's face in a cover of snow. I can't leave him. I can't, Matt sobbed. My lad, you can, Mr. Hornby said gently, for he's left himself. He's no longer here, but in God's glorious kingdom. So Israel died, and Matt obviously is not going all the way to Trenton to fight, but being rescued by Mr. Hornby. The old man put his arm around Matt and guided him to the horse. The Patriots are just down this road, Mr. Hornby whispered. There are Tories living all through these parts. If Colonel Rawl is alerted, these woods would be crawling with Hessian Jaegers and rebel hunters. We must make haste, like we must be quick. But Matt was so exhausted and overcome with grief that he began to topple over. He remembered little of Mr. Hornby lifting him onto the horse with a ride back to Hornby's farm. When Matt finally came to his senses, it was his sense of smell that came alive first. He sniffed the sweet aroma of wood, smoke, and apples. On opening his eyes, he found himself lying before a large fireplace. Several black cast iron pots and kettles hung from an iron arm that swung out over the fire. In the pot closest to Matt, a brew of spicy apple cider was slowly simmering. Matt yawned, lazily, <laughs> lazily savoring the delicious feeling of warmth that had spread over him. The bitter cold and dampness of the night before seemed so far away as Matt snuggled down into the cozy mountain of wool blankets that had been piled on him. It was a relief to feel good, finally, that he decided not to think about it and just to feel it. But as soon as he decided not to think about, think about it, he couldn't stop thinking about it. Why do I feel so good, Matt wondered, and where am I? Looking down beneath the blankets, he could see that he was no longer wearing his clothes. Instead, he had on a long white nightgown with ruffles around the collar and cuffs, winced, and instinctively knowing that it was a woman's garment. As Matt looked around, he could see that the room was not very big, one small window affording only light. Matt looked out the window and saw that it was an overcast day. He wondered what time it was, and he looked past the window to see a long, narrow table with some wooden bowls on it. In a corner, there was a spinning wheel. A basket overflowing with raw wool sat beside it. In another corner, a woman was sitting at a loom. A loom is where you make blankets from wool. She dressed very plainly in long skirts and a white apron. The expression on her face was as drab as the green colored shawl that she wore over her shoulders. Her gray hair was pulled back tight in an angry little bun. And the only sound that she made was a whack, whack, whack of her loom. 
and every now and then she would stop to nervously scratch at a scab on her face. Mrs. Pritchett, Matt thought on seeing her. She looks just like that crabby old Mrs. Pritchett from second grade. Suddenly the woman looked up and on seeing Matt awake, her thin lips curled down into a frown. She dropped the shuttle from her hand and sh rushed from the room. I could hear her shrill, tiny voice. Nathan, Nathan, he's awake, she cried. Calm down, Temperance, he's only a child. He'll bring us no harm, whispered Mr. Hornby, coming into the room. His being here is a harm to us, snapped the old woman angrily behind him. Mr. Hornby took a cup from a shelf and ladled some cider into it. He knelt down beside Matt and blew into the cup, testing to see if it was cool enough to drink. It's hot, lad, but it'll be, but it'll do you good, he said, carefully offering the cup to Matt. Matt thanked him and took a sip. Israel, my friend, is he, is he, yes, he's gone. Quit. <laughs> Sorry. And yes, he's gone, Mr. Hornby said gently. And were you close to being gone? And you were close to being gone with them. I would have passed right by if a drummer hadn't stopped me and asked me to look out for you. Henry, Matt croaked. I don't know what his name was. But he right saved your life. I was out along the Pennington Road, returning my sister, returning from my sister's farm when I met up with the militia. If I hadn't known Major Horse personally, I being a neighbor of his, I would have been taken for a spy for sure. They were that jittery, you see. But after Major Horse assured me that my loyal, assured them of my loyalties, I was given clearance to proceed to my farm. Mister Hornby reached for a small iron hook that hung beside the fireplace. He used it to lift a pot, a lift lid off a pot that was covered with hot coals. I could smell the rich aroma of a hearty stew as Mr. Hornby ladled some into a bowl. Try this, son, it'll give you strength, he said, handing the bowl to Matt. Now, where am I? Oh yes, on Pennington Road. It was a foul of night as I could ever see and the brave lads were trudging along and this drummer waved me over Hey, Mr. Hornby explained. He told me that you and your friend were down at the fork of the road and he asked me if I could assist you. Can you remember any of last night then? Mr. Hornby looked down kindly at Matt. Matt shuddered, looking over to the fire as the memory of the night before came rushing back. It's like a dream, he whispered, like a fantastic dream. And it got so horrible, I couldn't wake up from it. I feel like I still can't, Matt moaned. All right. That was those two chapters to make sure you use text evidence as best you can without having the book. So try to use things and keep listening to me reading to better understand it. Okay.